Welcome to season eight of the Life Giver Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Weathers. I'm a military spouse, clinician, and leadership coach. And Life Giver is where I get to spark honest conversations, interview experts, and encourage you with topics on military culture, marriage, and leadership. So give yourself permission to pause and lean in. There's something for everyone here. Life Giver Podcast. This is your host, Corey Weathers. We are in the midst of a series on leadership, and I want to tell a story that sets up today's interview. We've covered several things so far. We've talked about uh, the difficulty of apologizing and conflict um, as leaders. We've talked to Peter Docker about leading the next generation. And so I wanted to bring an interview with Paul McCullough, but I want to share with you how I got in touch with Paul and heard a little bit about his story. So if you've wondered if anything good can come from Twitter, believe it or not, this is the story for you. So I follow a couple of accounts on Twitter. Uh, Twitter has been a great place for me to throw out questions and dialogue about military culture and make sure that I am tracking some of the bigger issues and understanding some of the issues, especially for service members. And a couple of the accounts that I was following shared an article. Uh, it was on the AUSA page, their blog. And the title of this article was called Accomplish the Mission with Love. So I went to go check out this article. The person that was sharing it had not only wonderful things things to share about the article. But what really caught my eye is that this service member said they would follow a leader like this and that he they would be glad to hear an interview with a leader like this. So of course that caught my attention. I went to go read the article and it did not disappoint. This was a fantastic article written by Paul about his time in command and when he went through a deployment, how he chose to lead differently than his predecessor. So as he came off of toxic leadership and some of the other service members had experienced some toxic leadership to the point that they wanted to leave and not stick around. He had taken over command and knew that he had a challenge in front of him. So he decided to do something different during this deployment to lead differently, to take his opportunity in command, this role that so many people talk about being not only difficult, but time consuming and a lot more stressful than people realize until they get into that seat. He wanted to do something different different with it. And so I'm going to let Paul share his story. Paul's article will be in the show notes where you can read it for yourself, but I know that his story and the way that he shares it is going to be so much more powerful. Also, as an interesting side note, once I reached out to Paul to see if he would let me interview him and talk with him about his experience in command, it turns out we had interacted before because he is retired now working at the American Bible Society where I order all of my strengths workbooks for my strengths workshops. So turns out we had emailed actually a couple times and I just didn't realize his background or his story. So I'm so thrilled to share it with you here. Here's my interview with retired Lieutenant Colonel Paul McCullough. Um, Paul, what I'd love for you to do is just share your story. Um, what did you do in the army? How long did you stay in? I know your article, which will be um, linked in the show notes for you guys to read. Um, you share a little bit in the article about how there was actually a point in your career where you wondered whether or not you actually wanted to finish it out as a career. And, um, and then you decided to stay. So why don't you share a little bit about your background and your time in? Yeah. Thank you, Corey. So I served for a total of 20 years, two months and two weeks, but who's counting. <laughs> and I started off as a young quartermaster officer in 1998 when I got my commission and I retired about five years ago in 2018, in July of 2018. And so along the way, I went from quartermaster to acquisition, and I had one tour um, that was a little bit outside of mainstream acquisition towards the end of my career. And you're right, I was definitely thinking about getting out at one point in my career. I had just finished company command, and I came out of command, and I was sent over to another organization on Fort Lee, 
And the first boss that I had there, in my estimation, was really a toxic leader. He didn't care anything at all about his people. And he made me feel like really pretty comfy about coming to work. And at that point, uh, my wife and I had already purchased a house thinking that, well, hey, you know, I just finished company command. And in my mind back then, I thought that was a big deal. And well, I'm now going to be really marketable to companies. And so the big plan at that point, especially uh, now being under this toxic leader, was that I was going to finish company command and then look for a job. And so fast forward, I went through a very long uh, two-day extensive job interview process only for them to tell me that, well, we want you to go through a series of training and just because of the way that things worked out with timing and what they wanted me to do and what I was able to do, uh, that didn't work out. And so I decided to stay in the Army. And after making the decision to stay in the Army, now I had this new boss. There was a change of command, and a new 06 came in. And so when this gentleman took over, very quickly after assuming command, he came up to me and said, Hey, Paul, so I need you to deploy. And as part of that deployment, um, you're going to be gone for six months. And I want to do everything that I can to help care for your wife and son while you're gone. So tell me everything that there is to know about your family. And, you know, we lived off base um, in a small community. So it's not like we lived on base where there was a very tight um, FRG family readiness group. And so he was really diligent about caring for my wife um, and making sure that everything was okay with my young son, who at the time was less than a year old. But so then, can we pause right there for a second? Because I sure. don't know many leaders who've done that. Yeah. Did that feel rare to you? Well, that part did, but then it got even more special. So I went from impressed to absolutely stunned and unbelief. So shortly after that conversation, it was time for me to actually leave. And I went to Fort Carson, Colorado for about a month of training. And while I was at Fort Carson, uh, towards the end of it, there was a graduation ceremony per se. Now, this wasn't anything formal where you get something in your record. It was simply an opportunity for you to bring your family members in, if you could afford it, for them to say goodbye and you know see you off and all of that. They just made it into a nice little ceremony. I made arrangements for my wife and son to come. My boss found out about that. And he said, all right, well, I'm going to come out. I want to see you as part of this graduation ceremony. I want to see you off. But he didn't stop there. He said, hey, listen, uh, what's your plans with your wife tonight? Well, Sarah, I don't know. I have a young son. You know, we're, I'm just going to spend a little bit of family time, you know, take care of our son. He said, I am giving you a direct order to spend the night with your wife, and I will watch your son all night long. I don't care what time you come back, and I will watch your son all night long. And so we just had the time of our lives, an incredible dinner. We spent a lot of time there in the lounge and, you know, just having a lot of husband and wife time. And it wasn't until like 10 or 11 o'clock that we finally ended the evening and he was completely awake and he was still taking care of our son. And I have never in my career seen a leader take that level of sacrifice to go the extra mile for, you know, this young captain, you know, he's a 06 and I'm some young captain that's in his command. I, I have never seen that level of sacrifice and servant leadership coming from another leader. Yeah, no. And I, I would say very few, if any, have I ever known have done that as well. And so, yeah. well, and you mentioned this in your article, this, this shifted your perspective. Completely. So I went from having his predecessor that put a terrible taste in my mouth about the army. And then I had this guy come in with such a warm and caring heart. And I thought to myself, all right, if this is what army leadership can be like, I, I now have more faith in my army. And I know that it's possible to grow up to be a senior leader in the army without being fresh and rude and derogatory. I, I could go on of what his predecessor did. Mm -hmm. Well, and then um, later you get the chance to finally be in command yourself, right? And so this is where, this is where it gets really interesting because you know, I re I don't know if you saw it, but there was just recently um, another article that was circulating on Twitter that was talking about how difficult it was somebody that actually writing the, their honest perspective of what it feels like to to be a leader, especially in command, and how oftentimes, and I don't know what this is like. Um, you apparently have a perspective on it, 
but how how many service members feel like you that's like the culmination like you just can't wait to be in command yeah. and and want to lead a people group the way that you've always wanted to lead maybe it's because you have experienced toxic leadership maybe it's because you have had a positive experience and you can't wait to pay it forward and this article was um really giving the honest feedback of how challenging it really is, like how stretched you feel, um, how um, there's a lot of bureau bureaucratic red tape, how it's how sometimes you go into a situation and you have all these ideas to lead and how difficult it actually is to do well. Um, and I imagine that applies to people as well, especially the the larger number of people that you're working with and serving. And yeah. so um, that's where really your article comes to life because your article, which I'm going to give the title, Accomplish the Mission with Love, um, you decide to go into this deployment um, kind of wanting to shift things around. So mm -hmm. can you share, was it this particular leader that changed your your life and your perspective on leadership? Was there something else that made you want to go into this role in a different way? What kind of led up to that deployment? So there was definitely something else. I mean, the guy that... Um, I had the experience with for my first appointment to Iraq, he convinced me to stay in the army. But my perspective on the second deployment was shaped completely by my desire and my start of the path to go into ministry. So I was an acquisition guy. And for acquisition, um, command is being a PM or a product manager in a particular acquisition assignment. This was not that. Uh, this was another, hey, I need you to go do this. And so this came from the highest echelons within DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency. And they said, we need a lieutenant colonel to go and command this support team of 15 people out in Kuwait. And quite honestly, um, I pushed back a little bit about the idea of deploying because I was one year out from retiring from the military. And I had all these grand plans of, hey, I'm going to work with the VA. I'm going to tighten up my resume, my LinkedIn profile. I'm going to go out, start applying for jobs. My boss had already told me, hey, in this next year, yes, you know, you still have a job to do, but I'm going to kind of dial back what I'm asking you to do so you can dial up your transition for uh, becoming a civilian. And DLA essentially took that away. The Army took that away, whatever you want to call it. And they said, no, no, no. Um, before you retire, we have one last mission for you. And so you are going to deploy and you're going to be the commander for this unit. And so once I went there, uh, what I observed very quickly, the outgoing commander did not really seem to give a hoot at all about the team. Um, he was very much concerned about his report card, read OER, officer evaluation report. And he wanted to make his next grade but he really didn't care about the team. He just wanted like, you know, hey, we have to do certain things as a team. You go do this, you go do that. And he would, you know, get briefings from people, but stop there, put a pin in it. And my very first day in command, like I, I literally just got there, right? And he gave me the baton. Okay, here you go. Here's the flag. Here's your guide on. Good luck. I'm out, right? And that first day in command, I had three people come and knock on my door separately. And each one of them said, hey, sir, and I'm not really happy here. I'm not happy with the climate. It's hot. I miss my family. I don't feel like I'm making a difference. I don't feel like my voice is being heard. I want to go home. Three people said ex almost exactly the same thing within an hour of each other. And my message to them was, okay, please look on the door outside because you'll you'll see a different name out there. So... I'm not the guy that was just here. So I'm asking you to give me two weeks, two weeks to show you that I'm a different kind of leader. And if I haven't proven that to you in two weeks, then fine, I'll sign your document and, you know, give you the permission to curtail your tour. So I called up my wife and I said, honey, I've got a problem, right? I, I've got this really bad command climate and I, I, I want to make a difference. So I'm not sure of the best way to go about that. And she said, I just read this book called The Carpenter. And it talks about this same message of love, serve, care. So she was like, you need to read this book. It's really important. So I spent the entire afternoon, it happened to be my day off, and spent the entire afternoon reading through this book. And I was only in command less than a week at this point. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I was just absolutely convinced this is how I need to lead the organization through this idea of love, serve, and care. And I said, okay, well, how can I tangibly do this? How can I really put this into action? That just has some cute little slogan. And I thought about the love languages from Dr. Gary Chapman. And so I said, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. And I like I spent a lot of time trying to think about really tangible ways that I can do that in a field deployed environment and not violate any kind of regulations. So right. the next morning. <laughs> Can I pause yeah. you for just a second? Because, and you hinted yeah. at this in your article. Um, in fact, you said, let's see if I can find it. Um, you might ask love, what do love and compassion have to do with wearing the cloth of our army and defending our nation? And so when you talk about in leadership, loving those you're serving, it is kind of one of those soft skill words, right? It's mm-hmm. kind of the same category as empathy. And what do yeah. we do with empathy? It's soft, right? And so yeah. um, you make that point because that's um, not typically what people think of when they think of leaders. So what's really ironic about that whole thing, you know, you, you mentioned the word empathy. Uh, my personality type, if you look at Myers-Briggs, is an ESTJ. So when you read the description of that, and it's called the executive, which means I'm really good at getting things done. But oftentimes an ESTJ does that at the expense of other people's emotions because mm. you're so quick to want to get things done. You don't really have that empathetic side where you're paying attention to the emotions and the wants and the heart of the people around you. And so over the last several years, um, starting back several years ago, you know, during this experience, my wife started to slap me upside the head and she's like, what are you doing? You can't be in ministry and not being paying attention to the people side of the equation. And so, you know, as I started reflecting on all this, you know, you talk about being a strong leader. In my mind, Jesus Christ was the best leader to ever exist. Mm -hmm. And he didn't need to go around saying, well, I'm in command. I'm the boss. Do this. Like he led with love. Mm -hmm. And if that's good enough for the savior of the world, I think that's good (laughs) enough for me. (laughs) I love that. I love that. So, and, and I love the book, the five love languages. It's actually helped a lot of military families. And those of you who've not read it before, um, for me, I think it is like the easiest basic level. Like if you're looking for something really easy to make some movement in your relationships, uh, even parenting with your kids, it really outlines these five different ways that people understand love um, and receive love. And so here you are in Kuwait and you're trying to figure out how do I lead with these five love languages? Yeah. Okay. So unpack that for us. So I started thinking about each one and how I can make each one really come alive in a way that was meaningful to each person on the team. And so I started off, I said, okay, well, I really want to honor people for the work that they are doing, right? So instead of just saying, well, you know, this is your job, I expect you to do a good job and not really make um, a big deal about their good work. I wanted to really honor them for everything they were doing. So I took my money, not the unit's money, and I went to the PX and I spent about $100 and I got the biggest, gaudiest, most loud, you know, obnoxious looking trophy that I could possibly find because I really wanted to draw attention to it, right? And it was like, and it was at least two feet tall, probably closer to three feet. And I called it the Shining Eagle Award. And what I wanted to do was bestow this gift, this Shining Eagle Award, on the person each week that I caught doing a good job. So a lot of leaders, they go around trying to catch people doing something wrong. I went around trying to catch people doing something right. How did you decide between when people were just doing the job that you know, they were supposed to do, or were they, were they getting the award for something that was oh, like over and above? What yeah. Was that? So it, in my mind, it was definitely for an over and above. Mm-hmm. So the shining, and I uh, mentioned this uh, when I first gave out the award, the very first time that I gave it out, I gave, kind of gave this long, I don't want to say sermon, but you know, I you know, kind of have a pastor's heart, but I kind of went there. So I start talking about the value of each person's work and the right person being in the right seat in the bus and valuing each person's gifts and all those things. And I said, okay, so given that, I really want to be able to recognize people that are going above and beyond the call of duty for the customer. Because in my mind, um, 
if I would go above and beyond the call of duty for my team, then their natural inclination would be to now. All right. Well, if the boss feels good about me and the boss is going to pour into me, what can I do to pour into the customer? Like, how can I, you know, mm-hmm. turn that around? Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was for going above and beyond the call of duty and caring for the customer in some way. So mm-hmm. we were all in the same office and there was just cubes separating us. So it didn't take too much to listen to conversations and, you know, see them carry on conversations with people that they brought into our space. And so, um, that was the first thing was bestowing this gift. And then along with that, when the person came up, I gave them one of my commander's coins. And then I also gave them the ability to have a pass for a day of their choosing because you you were the recipient of this award. So instead of having one day off, during the week, you're going to have two days off. Mm. And so um, the only requirement was they just needed to run that through my deputy to make sure like, hey, I have you doing this mission on this day. It can't be this day, right? But yeah. you know, I want you to have some time because you really did a great job. So that was the gifts. Very quickly, I could tie to that words of affirmation because now before I bring the person up, I was up there singing their praises and I didn't say the person's name until well after I gave at least a good two, three minute talk and setting up the situation. This is what this person did. This was the outcome of this was, this is how it affected, you know, the unit. And then from there, this was the tertiary effects, right? So I really went on about what this person did and why it was so good and so important and how other people can maybe emulate that. And so Now I've got the gifts. I've got the words of affirmation. When the person came up to get the shining eagle on their coin, well, it it wasn't really appropriate in a command setting to hug people per se, as you might do in church, but I can certainly do a high five. Love language of physical touch is what you're That's right. Or physical touch. So a, a bro hug per se might not be appropriate, but I can certainly do a high five. I can certainly do a handshake. All those things are a fair game, even in a deployed environment. Mm-hmm. So then um, the next piece after that, I said, okay, well, if you are the recipient of the award for that week, my act of service for you is I want to help you with your vehicle. So the vast majority, I, I think, Everybody except uh, one or two people on the team had their own vehicle because, you know, we were responsible for all the logistics in Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Jordan. And we're traveling all over the place on a regular basis, each one of us. And so I said, all right, well, Sunday is our day off. And on my day off, I'm going to um, take your vehicle. We swapped vehicles on Saturday at the end of the day. So I'm going to take your vehicle. And on my day off, I'm going to take it to the wash rack. I'm going to personally wash it. I'm going to vacuum it out and I'm going to gas it up. So when you get your vehicle back, it is fully ready to go. Clean, smells good, all of that. No dirt, no dust, no debris. Mind you, this is Kuwait where there's sandstorms all over the place, right? Just massive amounts of sand and dirt and dust and debris on your vehicle, inside your vehicle and driving around a lot. Your vehicle gets, you know, uses up a lot of gas. So to me, this was a very powerful way to humble myself and serve the team. So a lot of commanders, they might say, hey, I'm going to designate this person. You're going to clean out my vehicle and watch my vehicle every week because I'm the commander. I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to flip the script. So, you know, I have um, a towel that I like to keep. So this is a very visible reminder for me of that act of service and what I need to do every day. So, you know, at the uh, last supper, Jesus took the time to get down on his knees and get a towel and wash the feet of his disciples. And I said, well, I can't wash people's feet because that's not quite appropriate in a deployed environment, but I can wash their vehicles. Mm. And I had a towel. And Mm -hmm. that towel got dirty, nasty, just like a regular towel. But if you take a shower or wash somebody's feet, But a towel is a very visible reminder of an act of service. And so then for the last piece, uh, the love language is time. And, you know, I had been married for quite a while at this point, nearly 20 years. And 
one of the things I know is important with my wife is spending time with her, right? Like you can't come home and not spend any time with your wife and then expect her to be intimate with you, right? Like you, you have to spend time with people to build relationship. And so I said, all right, well, here's what I want to do. Um, I tasked my XO. I said, I want to have an hour long conversation with each person every month. And so you work with every person on the team and set it up, put it on my calendar. You tell me where they want to go, when they want to go, and I will show up. Mm -hmm. So I paid for their beverage of choice, whether it be tea, coffee, soda, whatever. Um, I paid for their beverage of choice. And their only requirement was to come to the conversation and be ready to talk about, hey, how are things going for you? How's your job going? How's your family back home? What is it that you want to accomplish while you're here? What can I do to enable that? What are your concerns about what's going on here? How do you think we can, you know, I can lead better as the commander? What more would you like to see going on in our unit? What places would you like to go as a team for some camaraderie and fellowship? All these questions. And the more that I did this, the more that people really started to share really deep personal stories of their own life and what they're walking through. And so it became not just an opportunity to build team cohesion, but I was able to minister to these people on a regular basis because after a while, they started telling me very personal things about what's going on in their life. And I'm helping them walk through these difficult seasons of life. And at the same time, building a relationship and growing the team and, you know, really building strong bonds within the team. And so every month, every single person on the team. So that was probably 15 hours uh, of my life every month. And, you know, 15 times how much it is for a cup of coffee. So like five, six bucks, right? Every month. I didn't care. To me, yeah. that was really important. Well, and not to mention the amount of time it was washing cars, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Yeah. But you no. Know, okay. So I have several questions about this. So first of all, my favorite part of the story is you washing the cars and you taking them out for these talks. Like, I mean, maybe it's because those are my love languages or maybe it's just, those are the most time consuming, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is a little bit more familiar in the military culture to be awarded or given a gift certificate or not a gift certificate, a, a certificate a yeah. um, or given a coin or something like that. But these acts of service um, were the things that really were like, wow, like this person is going out of their way. Um, I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what was the impact on other people? But you clearly just talked about how um, obviously trust went up. Obviously, yeah. they felt um, that they could share with you what was going on in their world. Um, so I think the, the question that I have for you is, is, again, especially if there's leaders that are listening to this right now, what was this like for you? Because I wonder if there's um, other leaders that are listening to this going, man, I, that sounds great, but like, I don't know if I have the energy to do all of that, or maybe the skills to do all that. Maybe I would be exhausted, um, especially when some of them feel like they don't have enough time as it is. So mm -hmm. what was it like for you on that side to give as much as you gave? So, you know, one of the things about ministry writ large is that it puts a a burden or a weight on you. So you can't talk to somebody about what's going on in their life and genuinely mean the question of how can I help and tell me what's going on and you know how can I minister to you. You can't ask that question and really mean it without being willing to take on some of their burden, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I believe that we are called to bear one another's burdens. And you know, like Jesus Christ says, my burden is easy and my yoke is light because he takes our burden. So I, I feel it's my job as the commander to take on their burdens. So no, it was not easy. And we really had some difficult, heavy conversations during those six months. But even though I would go back to my room at the end of the day, absolutely exhausted between what took place with the regular work and what I may have, you know, heard and taken on and yeah, okay so now this person has this situation what can i do as the commander what can i do to pray for them what can i do to help you know energize them and make them feel loved and heard and valued and cared for that that was a lot but i will say that it was also the single most life-giving thing that i had ever done up until that point because it really showed me this is how you build a team 
really effectively, this is how you get an organization moving. An organization that's stagnant, an organization that people are unmotivated, people literally want to go home. Because after a while, when those two weeks were up, the same three people that told me they wanted to go home early, they came into my office. Hey, sir, I want you to tear up that document. I have a new document for you to sign. I want to stay here for as long as you're in command because I've never had a leader like you in my entire Army career. Wow. So to hear that is so incredibly life-giving. I was like, I don't care how much time or money this takes me. This is what leadership is, and I'm going to get after it because this is what God has called me to right now. Yeah, and can you speak to maybe the the leader that's listening that maybe doesn't have um, the education that you have from a faith based perspective, or maybe doesn't feel quite the comfortability to to take it? For, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is, I mean, I hear themes in there of you can do this even if you don't have a strong faith system. What you're advocating for in this article is what it means to actually love another person, regardless mm-hmm. of your faith system. That can be done, yeah. wouldn't you say? Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, yes, as a minister, I had certain, you know, tools in my kit bag of things that I was able to draw on when somebody would talk to me about a situation. But every single human being is capable of love, right? Love is nothing more than, hey, let me really show an interest in you. Let me show you that your voice matters, your life matters, your skill matters. I care about what happens to you. I'm going to come alongside when it's difficult times, and maybe I might just sit with you because that's what you need in that time, in that moment. Maybe I'm going to listen as you unpack about a difficult situation. Maybe I'm going to spend some time with you because maybe that's what you might need. Love is a very basic human emotion and has nothing at all to do with ministerial training. That just allowed me to do a little bit more. But being able to love the people that you work with and work for and have as you know, part of your team, that, that's a very basic thing. So if you just think about, you know, John 13, 34 says, love others as I have loved you, right? And the two greatest commands are love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and soul, and love others the way that you want to be loved, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do those two things, it, it becomes very, very easy to build that team and to have this incredible sense of teamwork and bonding. And when I left that unit, it was the most heartwarming send off that I ever had in my life. Like there were tears going on. I got this big giant plaque. People said so many nice things about me. Like it was the single greatest experience I ever had. Well, and you said a word in there, of course, obviously the name of this podcast is life giver for those reasons, right? Like what does it mean to actually be a life giver and, and to, um, give in such a way that breathes life into other people. And, and I think like, you just talked about that it was actually life giving to you, like as exhausted as you were being a life giver is someone that you get something back from that. You are filled by it. You are, yeah. um, you're, you, you have a passion for other people and a passion for what you do. You, and you have more joy in your work and in your relationships. And so there's this fear, I think sometimes that if I give more, if I do more, I'm going to be more burned out, more exhausted. But I think it's what you're really saying is that it's the quality of what we're giving. Like, yes, everybody needs to like do their job. There's nothing more frustrating than when someone's not pulling their weight. But when you also are pouring into the people around you, it lightens that load, like you said. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you also mentioned in this article, you talk about um, the current state that we are in right now, as far as um, recruitment numbers are down. Um, you know, I when I say that I've been watching um, this People First movement, I know for for those of us that are still in, when People First first came out, when McConville first talked about that, there was this. Um, you could feel the whole force, or at least the army side, just really kind of lift with this anticipation of like, oh my goodness, people first. What does that mean? Because we've been in a place for so long where the mission came first. The mission came first before family, Mm -hmm. before everything. And so I think there was this initial excitement and then it, it, it kind of like dropped, if I'm to be honest. And like like any movement does, it takes some time to get some traction. But I think that there was some discouragement on, and some confusion about, well, what does this actually mean to put people first? Yeah. And I was teaching this past week and I actually used the people first as an example when we were talking about how do you, I was actually talking to another commander about shifting the organization, just like you were talking about. And I said, you know, people first was a really good example of 
um, the power of what I would call campaigning, if you will. On mm -hmm. one hand, what McConville was trying to initially put out is how they were going to put people first. And while that is still left to be determined whether or not it's working or not, what it did do in the culture is people started using that phrase, people first, a whole lot all over the place, whether mm -hmm. it was the critique or whatever. And just like the way that I found your article and a couple of others, um, people started using this hashtag people first to actually point out when people were doing it right. Mm -hmm. And I told this commander this week, um, oftentimes I think shifting an organization or changing it around is deciding what you're going to be about yeah. and then consistently be about that. And it might take those two weeks, like you talked about, it might take a little bit of some time for people to see that you're actually being serious about what it is that you want to do and to kind of pilot that and test that and test the waters of whether or not you're trustworthy. But after a period of time of being consistent and saying that message over and over and over again, people eventually start to attribute that message towards you doing something right or not. But yeah. in this case with people first being able to go, it actually has been successful. People yeah. are actually sharing when other people are getting it right. And I think that that is fascinating. And you also referenced that when you talked about it was the right message. We just need to be teaching it to leaders so they know how to do it. So can right. you speak more on that? Yeah. You know, there's a thing in organizational behavior that talks about only about half. If you have, you know, X number of organizations, only about half will actually realize that there's something to the idea of putting your people first, right? It's not just about, you know, the work. The people actually make the organization run. And so you should probably do something about that. Now, of that half that realize that you should do something about it, only about half of them actually start taking some steps to do something about it. But the really unfortunate thing is only about half of that people group, so now you get down to that 12.5%, actually do things in a sustained manner where there's mm -hmm. programs in place, not just a cute slogan and not just something that we do for a couple of weeks, something that is sustained that people know that you mean business. This is about who we are. This is what we do. And so when I started this whole program, I had a meeting first with my lead team. So my exo, my deputy I was like, okay, if I'm going to be the commander of this organization, this is how I'm going to lead. And then after I got their buy-in, they said, hey, sir, you know, this is going to be hard. I was like, I, I'm aware, but I'm asking you to keep me accountable. And if I don't do what I say I'm going to do, I need you to call me out on it. And so then I had a meeting with the larger team. We had a morning meeting every day before we started off. And I said, okay, these are the things that we're going to do inside of my command. And again, I said to them, if I'm not doing my part, I want you to call me out and keep me accountable to you. Because as the commander of this unit, I essentially work for you, right? It's not the other way around where you work for me. No, no, no. As the commander with my name being out front, that means I am responsible for serving all of you to make sure that you have the tools that you need. You have the education you need. Your morale is in the right place. Your head is in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. Because if not, if something goes wrong, in the organization, we didn't do something, whatever. I did something wrong as the leader. I had a failure of leadership. If we did something right, it's because they did the good thing. They went out and they served the customer. Blame goes up, praise goes down. And so, you know, when we talk about people first, I think there absolutely is a lot of momentum around the slogan, around the idea. But part of the real challenge, you don't know what you don't know. And if I didn't have a pastor really pouring into me and telling me about that idea of love, serve, care, and then following it up with my wife saying, hey, read this book. It's about love, serve, care. And then having read the book by Dr. Gary Chapman, I wouldn't have any handlebars, so to speak, to grab onto. I wouldn't have anything tangible to say, this is how I'm getting after it. It's not because people don't want to. They don't yeah. necessarily know how. Yeah. So I feel it's our job as leaders to equip them. Here's the tools that you need to go out and be successful. So when we can start doing that as an army, I think that will completely eliminate the recruiting problem because people don't 
not join the army because of, oh, I'm scared of getting shot. Oh, this, oh, that. People join organizations because they want to feel like they're loved, they're valued, they're cared for. And sometimes the perception is, well, I don't know if I'm really being valued and cared for and loved in the military because I don't know, I have some family concerns. My wife is, you know, in the middle of getting a job. My kids are in the middle of school. And, you know, we we have this thing with the church. So what are we doing to really show compassion to the people in our military? What are we doing to really serve their needs, to really love them in meaningful ways? When we get that part of the equation right, I think that will really solve the recruiting problem. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think, and that's what I also loved about what you wrote, because um, it really gets to what is your circle of influence, that all of us have the ability to lead and influence someone around us. And if we just all work on that, like it does shift something Um, and not just waiting for someone else to fix it. Um, You know, I would love, before we run out of time, I would love for you to maybe address looking back on your career. um, What do you think now about the toxic leadership that you both experienced and that you heard about Um, especially given that you have a totally different career now, which we're going to make sure we get to here in a second. Um, What do you think now was going on with toxic leaders? Um, You know, I have my own theories, but what's your perspective now that you're out and in ministry? So I, I think a lot of the toxic leadership is about people chasing the next rank and especially among the officer community, chasing that elusive star. During my 20 years in the Army, I did meet some people, and they were very, very motivated about making their next rank and making the next star, and they were willing to do pretty much anything to make themselves look better than the person to their left or to their right. You know, sometimes they would... um, I'm going to use nice language, but uh, they would highlight the things that other people were doing wrong to divert attention off of themselves or Mm -hmm. maybe shine the light on themselves when they thought they were doing something right, even though it wasn't really their spotlight to have. The spotlight really belonged to the people in their command. Mm. So I, I feel like a lot of it is people's heart not being in the right place. And, you know, quite honestly, I was probably guilty of a lot of that. Um, I remember back when I was doing my very first company command and when I had my first platoon leader job, like I was not anywhere at all involved in ministry. And again, I didn't know what I didn't know because I didn't have people pouring into me. So I think it's a whole lot about having senior leaders. You talked about circle of influence, right? So even a person that says, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't know anybody. Nobody cares about me, blah, blah, blah. Every single person has some degree of influence because everybody is watching you. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your parents that are living with you. People are watching you, regardless of whether you realize it or not. People are watching you. Maybe it's the students that you know are coming over to your house to spend time with your kids. People are watching. You have influence. Mm-hmm. So if you are good to your kids, those kids are then going to turn around and be good to their people you know, that they are hanging out with. My kids told me story after story, and it just like warmed my heart about how they would serve other people in their high school because I modeled it for them. Mm. And they were able to take that same thing. Like every time I go to a drive through for fast food, I have this little card and I keep it in my car and it says, just a little something to let you know that God loves you, right? Mm-hmm. And I would pay for their meal and they would get this card instead of a bill, right? My daughter saw me doing this over and over and over again. So one day she says, hey, dad, I want to do that. It's my turn to pay. That, that was one of the best parenting moments I ever had, right? That was a big win for being a dad because I modeled what servant leadership looks like for her, right? And she was like 12 years old. Well, and look at what happened when someone else modeled servant leadership for you and what you went on to go and do yourself. I mean, I think right. that's an, another like adult perspective of that, right? Yep. So I'm going to butcher this quote. Um, but I was reading this book and there was this quote that stood out to me. And again, I'm going to, I'm not going to get it fully right. Cause it's kind of a complicated quote, but it basically said that it's really hard to have courage to do the right thing. Sometimes being standing up to, um, those in authority or, um, doing the right thing with integrity when your sense, when your paycheck and your sense of belonging depend on you doing otherwise. Mm-hmm. 
right? So like in the military, I used, I call it dangling carrot, right? Like there's a constant dangling carrot in front of service, service members, I believe. Part of it is because you want to get promoted so you can continue to provide for your family um, so that you can get to that 20 year mark. So sometimes I think it's for that reason. Sometimes it's, and so it can, it can create a paranoia. It can, can create, it can create um, this desire to like build out those e, um, OERs in a way that guarantee your promotion. And mm -hmm. so it can um, really get toxic in our own minds and in our yeah. own hearts after a while, the system and the way that the system is built to promote people into a place of security in their job, even if it is for their family's sake. And so I would agree that that is definitely going around. I would also add, especially over the last two decades, people are so exhausted. I think they're exhausted in trying to manage their own um, and their own health. They're managing their family's health. And so I think that a lot of people are exhausted in thinking that if I am now going to take care of all of these families or these soldiers or or whoever it is that I'm leading, that I'm not going to have the energy to do it. I'm just done or I'm just worn out or I just can't do it anymore. And so I think we find in our own lack of self-care, I think we lack the energy to even leverage that empathy or love, um, especially if you're just, if you see that finish line really close. Yeah. And so I feel like what I'm hearing you talk about is again, just how life giving this experience was for you, how it really modeled that you don't leave exhausted. You actually leave more fulfilled. And there's a way, um, just in loving other people that it comes back, like it, that pays it forward, whether it's someone else that goes and leads because you modeled that way, or whether it comes back in gratitude and seeing lives changed is just, I think the bonus of leadership that to your point in the article, we're not teaching in any of the schools. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I could just comment real quick on a couple of things you said, yeah. you know, when you talk about the temptation to go along with what the boss said, and yeah. maybe you feel like, mm, I, I don't know if I really agree with this. This feels wrong to me. Uh, again, I think it's about training and mentorship and developing that next generation of servant leaders. There was a movie I saw several years ago. It's called Courageous. And mm -hmm. it's a very powerful movie. But part of the uh, thing in the movie there was a young man and he was looking for a job and he finally got himself a job and he was about to get a promotion. And the guy said to him, Hey, um, I like you. I think you've been doing a good job. I want to give you a supervisor thing, but if you want the supervisor position, well, I, I'm going to need you to look the other way on some reporting things and some stockage levels. You, you need to look the other way. And if you can't do that, well, I, I can't, I can't give you the supervisor job and you probably just need to look for another position altogether. And so he went back and he talked to his wife and he's like, ah, I, I don't feel right about this. And I, I think I'm going to tell the guy no. And I, I'm sorry, honey. Like, I know I'm losing my job, but I have to tell the guy no because I, I can't do this. So he goes in and he tells the guys no. And the guy comes over to him. He shakes his hand, smiles real big. And he said, congratulations, you just got the job. Everybody mm. else that I ever talked to about this took the easy route and said, yeah, I'll look the other way to get the promotion. That's not the kind of leader that I want in my organization. Mm -hmm. You are. Congratulations. So I think it's really about one, having the intestinal fortitude to know what right looks like and yeah. be willing to make that tough call. I don't think you should do it in public. Like if you feel your boss is wrong and asking you to do something illegal or moral or unethical, don't die in the public, have a private conversation, but be willing to take a stand for what you believe is right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the other piece that you were talking about, I think it's just so important to have this idea of mentorship and raising up that next generation. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of that movie, the father that was, you know, kind of the catalyst for the entire show, um, he talked about raising up the next generation, right? So um, he lost, I think it was his daughter in that show, that he still had his son. So he, like, what can I do to pour into my son? How can I make my son a better man? So all of us have a circle of influence within our job, within our homes, within our church. What can we do to pour into other people? Because, you know, to your point, it's not about how tired you are, because in my experience, like, yeah, for that day, that moment, whatever, you might be a little bit drained, but it comes back to you tenfold. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about the thing with given um, at the drive through. So there was one day and I was like, man. You know, like I, I'm really low on money, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm really kind of in the mood for McDonald's and wh whatever. I'll, I'll have to figure out, you know, how I'm going to pay for this a little bit later. And that was the only time that that happened to me where it was like low on money. 
couldn't even afford McDonald's. And on that one instance, the person at the cashier, she said, oh, somebody just paid for your meal. They wanted to bless you. I was like, well, that's God right there. What? Because the one time I really needed it, God showed up and paid for my meal because he just brought it back to me in the blessing that I need at that time. Oh my gosh. What a great story. And and yet not surprising, right? So I'm starting to sound like a little old lady, but now I've got this bird feeder that's outside of our kitchen. And there's just like all of these birds that are suddenly just flocking to it. I can't feed them fast enough. But every time I see them in the morning, I just think about that scripture that's like, you know, here I am providing, right, for these birds. And they're just showing up the next day hoping there's food out there again. But, mm-hmm. you know, it is it is almost this reminder that God is a provider. And here I am providing for them. And it's that prompting, this desire in me to want to care for something outside of myself that ultimately leads to their provision, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we are not going to be people who allow that prompting within us that are open to um, to the desire to take care of others, we're missing out on this amazing opportunity to not only change someone else's life, but have our lives changed also in the process. So, yeah. well, Paul, I don't want to end this time without you sharing, like that was your first career, maybe your second career, but you're totally doing something different, yeah. um, which I think is also very, I don't want to say it's rare, but it's different um, compared to what most people's experiences are. So here you retired from 20 years in the army as a Lieutenant Colonel, and obviously you've dropped hints along the way that you're in ministry now. So share what this is like, this transition into this completely different career and what you're doing now. So my very first year out of the military, um, my first job was as a chief operating officer and chief value officer in a small business startup. And, you know, I was honored to get that position and, you know, be part of the C-suite and help to grow the organization. But I was working 18 hours a day and it was not life-giving for me at all because the leader of the organization, like again, being the COO, I was responsible for all the operations, like making the trains go, right? Keeping the ship moving. And the CEO of the organization would regularly say, revenue is all that matters, right? Revenue is king and uh, money is all that matters. Like we're just constantly driving revenue and profits, all the man cared about. And I said, well, no, I, I'm sorry. Like revenue isn't king. Christ is king, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not profit that matters. It's people that matters. And like, we just kept butting heads on this issue. And after a while, he was like, I'm the CEO, shut up and color. Mm-hmm. And so after six months, I was like, all right, th- this is this is not the place for me. And so I started looking around and doing job searches. And so, you know, I did a Google search for um, ministry jobs in Philadelphia. That that was the only criteria I put in. And it came up with American Bible Society. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, I, I don't really know anything about this. I haven't heard of this organization. And so I put in an application and on their website, the only jobs that were open were in IT. And I said, okay, well, this isn't quite ministry that I've been training for the last couple of years, but at least it's in the right organization. And I do have a background in IT. My bachelor's and master's are in IT. So you know, I, I think I could do that. And so I didn't hear back, no response, no, no, nothing. Um, And like three months had gone by. So I was talking to a group of men in my men's group one day. And one of them said, Hey, my wife works for the American Bible society. You should talk to her because I think she can help you. Okay. So we go to the same church and I saw her the next Sunday at church and she was like, Oh no, no, no. You applied for the wrong thing. She said, you need to apply for the armed services ministry because, you know, with your background as a retired lieutenant colonel, that's where you would be a good fit, not the IT department. Okay. (sighs) So she connected me with the guy that was uh, running that piece of the organization. And I had a really good interview with him. And one thing led to another. And two months later, I was brought on board with the armed services ministry. And so I've been there now for three and a half years. And my entire mission set is to get the word of God into the hearts and hands of veteran service members and their families across the country. Now that takes a lot of forms and I do a lot of things around that, but that is an incredible mission set. And it's really getting after the great commission of, you know, go and spread the gospel to all the corners of the world and all of that. And I'm doing it in the military community that I spent 20 years in. So to me, it's extraordinarily life-giving. And no, I don't think it's an ordinary career transition, but it's God-ordained. It's what God had for me. 
Yeah, 100%. And you know, when I hinted earlier, I found you on on Twitter with your article. And then um, it turns out like you've been somebody that I've been corresponding with. Every time I do a strengths event, the American Bible Society provides um, these amazing workbooks. Um, and in some cases, strengths codes for um, for strengths events. And so um, thankfully, you've been behind even championing the strengths books to go um, out to Germany where I'm headed out um, this year to serve some spouses there. And so yeah. we've actually emailed back and forth coordinating with those resources. And so it's amazing how something can come full circle. It's amazing how a common passion of just taking care of people um, connects you. And so I'm so I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful in, in what God has done in your life and um, this path that you've been on that has just been, you know, it's just like God to do something that is that is perfectly aligned with what brings you joy, but also has some surprises in it along the way. Yeah. Um, and I'm so grateful that you continue to give and you've, um, you know, Matt and I always talk about, you know, sometimes it's good to be a almost like a mad scientist to do an experiment on yourself before you go out and teach it to the world. And I, and I see what you've done, especially during that last deployment. That's what I, that's what I look at it and see. You did this like massive mad scientist experiment just to see if you could change the culture and taking on that risk yourself. And by doing that, you found something amazing and was a part of something amazing. And, and now it, it will go on to influence so many other leaders to consider leading in a new way. And so yeah. I'm so thankful, Paul, that you wrote this and that I found you officially. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for what you're doing today um, to impact the lives in our force. We have so much need in families um, today. So as we close, is there anything that you can share for people who want to uh, maybe take the next step, whether it's in leadership or maybe somebody's listening and their faith has been stirred a little bit? Um, if you want to share, I know that there's some programs that are coming out. What would you, um, through the American Bible Society, what would you like to share as kind of some closing thoughts? Yeah, I really appreciate that. Well, you know, within the Armed Services Ministry, we really do have some exciting things that we currently have and that are coming down the pike. So one of the things that I like the most about um, the Armed Services Ministry is those programs that we offer. For the last two years, we have been uh, really encouraging people to do this thing called the Military Bible Challenge. So it's a 75-day Bible reading plan, and even if you've never picked up the Bible a day in your life, maybe you don't know anything at all about faith or God, this will really walk you through getting to know the God of the universe, because it is nothing but the fundamental stories in the Bible and the nature of God's love. It's nothing heavy. It's nothing difficult to understand. It's really just helping you to get to know God on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And so that's available on, on uh, our website. What, what's even more exciting is that within the next couple of months, I would say probably this summer, we're going to have an app version of that Military Bible Challenge that is even more interactive, engaging, pictures, music, questions, really helping you to take that next step on your spiritual journey so that maybe you don't know who God is or how much he loves you. This will help you to get that. And then the second piece, if you want to take a little bit of a deeper dive, there is a program that we're getting ready to launch, and it should be coming out around the September, October timeframe. And this is called Recon. And this is probably the premier thing that the Armed Services Ministry um, has done or will do um, in their foreseeable future. So Recon is based on three premises. So one, we are taking what we refer to as the bingeable content like you would get in Netflix. So we're telling stories about other people's spiritual walk that they're willing to share. And we're doing it in the form of episodes that are, again, this bingeable content. So you can see, well, okay, God did this thing for somebody else. If he did it for them, he could do it for me. Mm -hmm. The second piece is now we're going to have a masterclass type of instruction. So instead of having Gordon Ramsay teach you how to cook, we're going to have a senior pastor help unpack different scriptures in the book of Mark and really walk you through that and unpack different pieces of it to help you better understand God's word. And then the last piece is taking the reward aspect of Peloton and making the 
recon program be something where you can track your progress? You're looking at your spiritual readiness, your spiritual health. How often have I read the Bible? How am I doing on taking my next steps? So really keeping you accountable and showing you the progress that you made from when you started out. So this is something that we are really excited about. And we think it's really going to help people take that next step from, well, I know about God. I know of God. I know there is a God. That's really about it. I don't know a whole lot about them. I don't have this relationship with them like you do. And it's helping to move people along where maybe now they're reading their Bible, they're going to church, they're getting after it, they're praying, they're in a small group. So moving them along in that next step on their spiritual journey. So the combination of those two things, I'm just really excited about. I'm super excited about them too. And so I will have all of those links in the show notes where you guys can find access to them. Or Paul, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm really thrilled in how it worked out. And I'm um, so thankful again for all that you're doing. So thank you so much for joining me. Such a great story. I absolutely love when you hear a story about someone who is just kind, who's just willing to be thoughtful towards another person and do what to them is the right thing and just taking care of someone in front of them. It just takes a moment to pause, to think about the people that are around you and what they're going through, what their life must be like, what season of life that they're in. When Paul talked about that 06, stepping in to take care of him and his family, I don't know if that 06 realized that he was going to change the trajectory of not only Paul's life and his ideas of leadership, but also shape um, an experience and a perception of the military for Paul's entire family, just because that 06 was thoughtful and kind. And, you know, when we go through experiences like that, it makes us want to pay it forward somehow. And so you just never know how a small act of kindness can change so many lives. Um, we change generations with that act of kindness. And Paul is an example of that. He went on to just treat the people in front of him with kindness and dignity and respect, recognizing that sitting in front of someone and listening to what going on in their life gives him the information he needs to lead better, to treat them with that kindness. Uh, and, and it just shapes an entire um, work culture and it um, changes the trajectory for so many people and for so many families. This is actually what my new book coming out in November is all about. Even though it's filled with like telling the story of our military culture over the last two decades of war, it is ultimately about people. It's about learning to see the person in front of you in their context, understanding their story, understanding what military life has meant for them, like what their experience of the military culture has been. Everybody comes from a different generation. And so my experience of the military culture as a Gen X is going to be completely different than a millennial's experience of the military culture. And that's going to be definitely different than the Gen Z experience of the military culture right now that is imprinting on their lives. And if we can learn to see the people in front of us, number one as people, but number two, people that have a story to tell, then we can become such better leaders. And that is my hope for this podcast and all also for the book coming out, Military Culture Shift, to empower leaders, whether you're a spouse, whether you are a service member, whether you're in politics or dealing with policy, all of us have the influence as leaders in whatever it is that we do in shaping those around us, especially those in the military culture. So, so grateful for Paul and his example. And it's also a really good reminder that oftentimes coming out of our passion and and our conviction of what feels right to us, those next steps as far as those jobs into retirement or trying to figure out what to do in that transition, that those steps can fall into place. We just have to pay attention to what we're really passionate about and also what we're really good at. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode. There are more episodes coming your way, all to inspire you to not only be a better leader, but also be a life giver in someone else's life. I'll see you next time on the next episode. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for listening to the Life Giver Podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast or leave a review so others can find it as well. Were you thinking of someone else who would benefit from hearing today's episode? 
You can be a life giver to them by simply sharing it with an encouraging note. If you would like to connect with me or find out more about my work, you can visit www.coryweathers.com.